so sorry. and their safety. I'm also a project. Deb, you are on. You're muted, Deb. So you want me to talk? Hello, uh, my name is Deb Peterman. And I am a transition coordinator for and community connector for the Center for Disability Empowerment. I'm also a project manager for the Ohio Family Network Grant through the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. Thank you for joining us today with this presentation, 911, Let's Get Ready. We all know that it, this is important to be prepared for an emergency. If you have a disability or are a person with a disability, it may take more planning and preparation to ensure your safety and their safety in their emergency. So please uh, meet Jamie Larmer and uh, she'll take it from here. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, we, I just wanna go over a few points to note um, before we get started. So first, I would like to talk about the Center for Disability Empowerment. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that supports all people of any age with any disability. And we do this through various programming and our five core services, which we are federally mandated to provide as a Center for Independent Living, uh, those of which being information and referral, uh, independent living skills training, advocacy, whether that's uh, teaching someone how to be an advocate or larger systems advocacy, uh, peer support, and the final aspect, the final uh, core service is transition services. There are two parts to that. There is youth transition services. And then uh, Deb here is our nursing home transition coordinator, as she stated. Um, and then also I would like to cover some webinar etiquette before. Um, attendees will be muted during this webinar. You can use the chat feature in Zoom to post questions and communicate with the host. If you prefer to voice a question, please use the raised hand feature and you will be unmuted. This webinar is being recorded and we will post an archive of the webinar on our YouTube channel. The link will be shared via email along with the slide deck and any resource pages from the speakers and the session evaluation. And with that, I turn things back over to today's moderator. Sorry. Can I go sit? I'm sorry. I was going to say good morning myself. Um, I'd like for us to test the chat. We're going to ask you questions throughout this uh, session. So if you could test the chat and tell us what your spirit animal is. Who is your spirit animal? What animal is it? A wolf and a dog. I love that chameleon. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.
there are still some answers coming in, so I'll give them a little bit more time before we get started. Okay, are we ready everyone? I will take that as a yes. Hi, my name is Marley and I am the I was the project manager for the emergency readiness series, my office, the Center for Disability Empowerment, hosted recently. In 2007, I was in a major car accident which resulted in a T10, T12 spinal cord injury. Now that I am a wheelchair user, I have found that I need to think differently regarding my health and my safety. Today, we will be sharing lots of information and resources to help you process your needs in an emergency. And I'm very excited to be with you all today and to be working with my co-host, Dee Marks. Thanks, Marley. Hi, everyone. I am Dee Marks, and I am a parent mentor for Dublin City Schools. As such, I help families who have children with a variety of disabilities. I am also a parent of a son with autism and have found that due to his communication limitations, I need to be proactive in understanding what he needs to know prior to an emergency, and then also how to share the information with first responders when he is a unable to share it himself. Together, Marley and I hope to better prepare you as well. In the chat, would you quickly share with us what type of emergency quick most concerns you, as whether a person you're a person with a disability, a professional, or a caregiver? What type of emergency concerns you the most? Fire seems to be a big one for everyone. Car accident. I see a lot of fires, I agree with you. And actually the one that concerns me the most with my son is also fires. And I'll go a little bit more into that later, but I'm also seeing a lot of how to deal in an emergency situation. If there's a car accident or a person is with autism is escalated, how to be able to respond effectively to those situations. No accessible escape route. We'll get into that a little bit today too. Well, thank you for sharing. I'd like to also welcome with us today, Rigo Quintanilla and Brad Flora. Rigo is with the Dublin Police Department and um, Brad is with the Washington Township Fire Department. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for being with us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been working as a first responder? Rigo, would you like to go first? Thank you for that introduction, Dean. Uh, I have been a Dublin police officer for almost nine years. I am currently a school resource officer uh, assigned to Davis Middle School. I have previously also been at Sells Middle School where I actually got to meet Dee's son. I'm familiar with CJ. Um, so I've been with the police department for several years and uh, I enjoy being in the schools. And so I have a little bit of, actually I've gotten probably more than the common officers experience in dealing with situations or questions that come with this uh, great resource that you guys are about to do. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and to share a uh, police perspective on some of the questions that some of your folks might have and to be able to assist and uh, have better communication with our community members. Thank you. Brad, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, thanks again for the introduction. Um, I've been with the Washington Township Fire Department in Dublin since uh, part-time since 2001 and full-time in the Fire Prevention Bureau since 2012. Um, I think the big thing with us, I mean, being in the Fire Prevention Bureau, we are involved with a lot more of the education. Um, we have recently started a 
um, fire safety education program for students with uh, autism. And uh, we're in the third year, COVID sort of hurt us last year, but we've had some great interactions and we're, we wanna be the ones that are here for to share this with any fire departments around and we're there to help everybody because fires don't just happen in one area, they happen nationwide. Absolutely, um, great. So I'm gonna ask you guys this question. As a first responder, can you share a few situations where you found yourself in the field and you have faced a challenge when helping a person with a disability? So Rigo, can you share a situation where you found yourself in the field and a challenge was brought to your attention based on trying to help someone with a disability? Um, well, being in the schools, I actually have a lot of interactions um, more so. Some of the questions were focused on like fires and um, car accidents, which obviously as police officers and even as uh, EMTs and firefighters, we have a lot of experience, unfortunately, a lot of experience with those. Um, I have had more experiences in the school buildings and dealing with kids or mostly students, obviously, because that's who's in the schools uh, with disabilities and just trying to work through uh, finding what works for them. And some of the experiences that I've had is sometimes is, is as an officer, uh, sometimes when we arrive on scenes, we want uh, to try and fix everything or make everything uh, back to somewhat normal. Um, and what I've found in some of my experiences in dealing with depending on the disability, obviously, um, uh, is just slowing down and finding ways to communicate with someone if they're, if one of their uh, disabilities is not being able to communicate. Um, for example, I have some experiences with Deason, um, CJ, uh, in, in just taking the time to slow down and make sure that he's understanding what I'm saying, or at least figuring out ways. And that may sometimes be in speaking with and I have the benefit here at school uh, of being in contact with his teachers or the people who are his support system uh, and, under, and asking them questions as far as how is he best understand so that then we can um, uh, facilitate conversations with that. And then uh, actually Dee and I talked at length last week about a situation where her son, uh, not necessarily during school, but a school event um, uh, just, ran away for lack of a better way of describing it. He ran a different direction than the rest of the team. Uh, and she was able to reach out to one of the school resource officers like myself, where CJ was at school at the time. And though he, that officer was not working, we were able to communicate to other officers who were working. Um, the number one, the importance of finding him as quickly as possible. And some of the things that presented challenges uh, once they did find him uh, and, and mostly communication. And once we, once we were able to communicate, then it changes the level of comfort for the officers, for myself, to be able to interact with them and make them feel comfortable because we all get nervous. Even me as a police officer, if I run into a police officer off duty, your sense of anxiety raises a little bit, even though I'm, I know what's happening and what they're trying to do. Um, I can only imagine how someone who doesn't work in this line of field and they see a police officer, all of a sudden their anxiety goes up and so we try to calm that down and work through situations that way. So again, I'm appreciative of being here in this in the opportunity, not only for be able to share some of my experiences, but to also learn uh, different ways to be able to help community members with a variety of, of disabilities. Thank you. Brad, what about you? What challenges have you faced working with the police, I mean, the fire department in regards to helping a person with a disability in an emergency situation. It'll start out with Rigo. It's a lot about communication, understanding the person and realizing that just because a kid has autism or a disability doesn't mean that you'll see the same person. Every person is different. We can't count them all as, hey, they're, they all have autism. They're all going to act the same way. They don't. Um, I was teaching CPR at Dublin schools one time. And uh, what got me was when the fire alarm would go off, they, they take all the kids with special needs or disabilities out because they go, it really messes with them. And they had an incident where the fire alarm went off um, 
accidentally and they weren't prepared and one of the kids basically took off. They found him in a bathroom hiding. So from there, that was my big challenge is we cannot, I, we've got to find a better way and you're not going to, you're not going to change everybody, but we got, have to find a better way to do some education and we have to do it individualized. We can't do it in a group. I mean, we, our program does do it in a group with a group of like three or four kids in a school, but sometimes we have to break off and understand that there's only certain levels that certain, um, depending on where they're out on the spectrum that they understand or they can take in one day. We don't want to overload them to where we freak them out, but we really want to, you know, we want to make sure we take care of, you know, anybody with a disability. And the big thing we're doing right now is in the schools, because we have a access point. We don't have any clue unless somebody gets a hold of us what is out there with adults we don't we don't have the resources the relationships we have with Dublin schools so for me um, I think the big thing is that's what we want to reach out show what we have show where we can help because we don't know what we don't know what about someone uh, sent, just sent me a quick chat what about both for Rigo and Brad? What about have you faced a challenge when helping an adult? Perhaps someone even in an assistant uh, living facility or within their home and they're wheelchair bound or um, those kind of concerns. Can either of you kind of expand a little bit about how you've s faced a challenge with that? Uh, yeah, I was as Brad was speaking, I was thinking of that. Like we both kind of focused on the on the on the younger kids section of it, which we both have a lot of experience. I, I see Brad around the schools all the time. Um, yes, the one of the biggest differences, though, that I that that I will say that it benefits us and let and I get I agree with Brad that we don't know what we don't know. And when we show up on something, we we have to try to decide that you know, relatively quickly, especially if it's a, a an emergency situation. Um, but we rely a lot on the resources around. So if if, for example, if if D, if you were to call the police to say, "Hey, I, I have, uh, I'm having an issue and and I need help," okay, so the dispatcher is going to ask some important questions about what exactly you need, um, and then we're the dispatchers, if they're if if they have the capabilities or the time, uh, are going to try to get as much information as possible. And sometimes you're able to say, like, you're obviously D have been around and doing this work for some time. Uh, and you have a great relationship with us as a police department and you're, you could say, hey, my son has this. And that basically kicks off a different mindset for us as to how important this is. Uh, but when we show up like on a scene, uh, for example, like Marley mentioned that she was in a terrible car accident and had uh, an injury, she's still able, assuming she's away, she's still able to communicate with us and we can, she can tell us, hey, I'm having, uh, my legs don't work or my arm doesn't work. And then we can facilitate a response from that. That's the way kind of we would work with through those situations if someone's able to explain to us what's happening. In other situations, we show up where we have very little information and through very short conversation or very short interaction, we're able to determine that there's something there. And obviously we're not medical people to be able to determine whether it's autism or if they're having just a, a mental episode or whatever it may be. So we try to gather as much information. Now, I will say um, our state um, and our police department and, and specifically, we've created new policies to where as soon as we determine that there's something not necessarily uh, what we would define as normal, I know that word is not appropriate, uh, but what we would say, they're able to have a, a direct conversation with me. If soon as we detect that there's something that's off or not, maybe they're just going through a, a mental episode, um, our, our approach has to change immediately and how we deal with them. That doesn't mean we may not change what we ultimately do. It just means we have to analyze and maybe be part of it is just like I mentioned earlier, it's just being more patient as a police officer in dealing with, with those situations. And we uh, here in Franklin County have had to, uh, there's a couple of different agents or through Columbus Police 
and through the Franklin County Sheriff's Office where they have uh, a quick response team. If we have a person who's in having a, a, a psychotic episode um, that we can call and rely on them. And basically we kind of contain the situation until someone that from uh, net care is actually riding with them and someone who's a trained professional uh, can assist us through that process. Um, so that's usually how we deal with them. We try to use as much as the information uh, around. Um, and if they're by themselves, then we obviously have to determine that ourselves. And as soon as we get an indication that something is not specific, not necessarily what we would consider uh, an average conversation, then we have to then change our approach. And that may be, okay, we're gonna have to, the normal de-escalation may not work. We may have to go even further down the ladder or up the ladder of de-escalation and, and just be patient and try and figure out exactly what's going on through communication. So that's, I mean, ultimately it's all about communication like Brad mentioned and I've mentioned it's, it's us as much information as we can draw in. Um, that's what we were trying to do. Let's see if comes. Thank you. And that's one of the things we're going to really hit home on in this presentation when Marley and I move forward with it is how caregivers, professionals, people with disabilities, all anyone in the community can better prepare. So that way, when you get there, if they're not able to communicate, they can at least have an effective way of sharing that information with you. Uh, Brad, what about you? Any situations related to adults? Well, um, one thing we are... Um, Doing in Dublin, and I don't know if your local fire or EMS does, we also have a special needs registry, and that's for people of all ages. So if we have it to where we know, hey, um, if you go to this address, you're going to meet Joey. Joey has this, and it helps us going in because it flags us right away in our dispatch. Um, we'll let us know, hey, look at your notes. Um, and with that being said, we have a little better understanding going into a run that we might have somebody that is acting different, but it's not, they're acting different. They have autism. We need to know how to relate and it changes the mindset going in. So with that being said, I mean, that's a huge thing. And if you don't have it in your local fire department, I don't have a problem sharing how we do ours. And we got ours from Delaware County to, to help out because if, if we know going in now, if we get on a wreck, like Rigo said, we might not know unless a parent's with them or somebody that understands them. We don't know. So if we are on something, the more you can give us, the better. But I think that special needs registry program has been tremendous for us because it flags the house. Now, granted, you know, if we're going in on a time that they're not at the house or at the school, we got to put two and two together or they're at work. We got to put two and two together. But if we're going to your address and you're registered, it gives us a better picture of how we're going to react. Thank you. And that's, that's, um, I see a question. How do you sign up for that? You contact your local police department and fire department and ask for specific accommodations to be added into their database. So one of the things that, for instance, that's added for my son is not only the location of his bedroom, because he may not escape within the house, but also if he is, um, you know, if I'm asking for a police response or whatever, that the sirens are turned off two blocks before my home, that the lights are turned off, that they come in using soft voices and um, only one person approaches at a time. All of these things can be added into the database so they can respond effectively. So thank you, Brad and um, Rigo, for sharing that part. I think we're going to move forward onto the actual presentation, and I'm pretty sure it's going to answer a lot of questions. Um, and then Brad and uh, Rigo are going to stick around and answer questions as we move along as well. Um, let's see here. So the focus is, and what you're hearing, is we need to be better prepared. We need to have preparation. We can't prevent an emergency from happening. But if we practice and we prepare, there's a stronger likelihood that we'll survive a significant emergency situation. For the purpose of today's training, I want to ask, what is considered an emergency? Bottom line for us, it's any time a person is hurt or likely to be hurt. 
We want you to be prepared to act in that situation and then to also understand both the role of the first responder and your personal role because they are different. Speaking of being prepared, let's watch a short video clip of Marley with the fire department during an emergency stairwell exit. One second as I set up the video. Should I get started and speak while we're waiting on the video? Yeah, please. Okay. So just to tell you guys a little bit, this video of me was taken when we had a power outage at the office. So the elevators were not working at that time. It was an emergency, but there was no immediate danger for me. And I actually tried to roll down the stairs backwards. That's something I've been taught how to do. Um, halfway down the stairwell, we realized that I can't clear the next landing in there. So we ended up having to call the fire department to come and rescue me for the last uh, four or three flights down. Do you think that? Uh, no. Uh, this old one piece, though, yeah. it's not going to come apart. Uh, it shouldn't. I've been in it all day and it hasn't so far. Okay. But it has to but go backwards, guys. That's going to help the girl. Wait or not? No. Okay. I will hold it this old one piece, though, yes. it's not going to come apart. Uh, it shouldn't. I've been in it all day and it hasn't so far. Okay. But it has to but go backwards, guys. That's going to help the girl this way. Okay. Okay. We'll lean you back. Okay. And then, uh, yep, we can take turns once we get down. We're going to do what we need. We're going to do what they didn't take turns. They powered it all the way down. Okay, so should there have been a real fire, the elevators would, be, would have been shut off and we would not have been so casual in the moment. And had we not done this at that time, it would have been incredibly dangerous for me to try to go down the stairs on my own, only to realize that I can't clear the landing. Um, so in the chat box, chat box, excuse me, please put a quick yes or no as to whether you would need special accommodations in order to evacuate a building if you're on the second, third, or fourth floor. Okay. A lot of no's and some yeses are coming through. Thank you, everyone. So in a, in a fire situation, in any building, anywhere you go, if you are unable to use the stairway, several things should occur in the case of a power outage, fire, or explosion. If you're alone, are you safe and able to call 911 for help? If not, are you able to get to a safe place before calling 911? Inform the dispatcher exactly where you are and where you will, where you will be. Name of the building, the floor, the stairway, what room number you're in. Most buildings have a fire safe wall in the stairway, so that's always generally where you will meet first responders if you cannot get, uh, get down on your own. But also depending on your disability or your abilities, you might be carried down like I was in the video. Sometimes you'll be transferred into an evacuation chair and carried down, or they could also use a sheet to carry you down. So honestly, it just depends on the, the station and their resources, I, I feel. Um, and this is why planning is so important. It really is up to you to make sure that you stay safe until first responders arrive. If someone is with you, are they able to help you down? Some people practice their evacuation plans with coworkers during office fire drills. Planning can save you precious time that you might not otherwise have. If someone is with you, but they're not able to help you evacuate the building, 
they can at the very least confirm to the first responders that you are in the building un and unable to get out due to a disability. Again, using specific language, such as on the third floor stairway, second floor, room 10, left of the elevator. Specific details without being wordy or long-winded. Keep it short and keep it simple. For those of us living in the Columbus area, you could explore something called the Knox box for your house. For your house. It is provided for free and we have applications available for those interested. Usually first responders would break down doors that are locked to get to the person on the other side. So the Knox box is a locked key box that is placed at the top of your front door. Should first responders need to get to you, they can use their master key to unlock the box, grab your house key from that box and unlock your door. This is a wonderful program because especially considering that the alternative means that your door would get broken down and you will likely have to cover the cost of getting it fixed. Plus, I feel like there's that's a lot of precious time saved for first responders um, to be able to just unlock your, court, your door versus breaking through it. One thing to keep in mind about the Knox box is that it can be an indicator to those that know what it is that there is a person with a disability that lives in that house. Um, you, that might mean that you are considered an easy target for breaking. Um, if there is a gas leak, evacuate the building quickly, but you'll likely be able to use the elevator in that instance. A water incident could go honestly either way for those of us who use durable medical equipment. My, um, we, my manual wheelchair would be hard to push depending on the level of water, but I wouldn't be worried about damaging the motherboard or the motor. And power wheelchairs are expensive, guys. I mean, $40,000 and over we're talking. Um, in a situation like this, firefighters will help those that are still in an immediate danger. Home or building fire, they will run through the crowd to get to the people that are still in the building and get them out. Um, they will try to contain the fire and hopefully subdue it. They will tend to those who need immediate medical attention first, then move down the list of priorities. Um, remember, it is your job to stay safe long enough for them to be able to reach you. There are way more of us than there are of them, and we will need to help ourselves until first responders can get to us. Thank you, Marley, for that information. Another point to consider is that sometimes a person with some types of disabilities may not understand the full concept of why a fire is dangerous. In this case, it's important to focus on using language and practice strategies that are relevant to the individual to ensure action on their part, even if they don't comprehend the full situation. For instance, my son would most likely not exit if he saw a fire, because no matter how much we practice, I'm definitely not gonna use actual fire in order to show him that it can be painful. Unfortunately, it means that most likely in a real fire, he's not going to try to escape until he is hurt or he realizes the pain and that is much too late. So with him, I've taught him that when he hears the smoke alarm, he is to leave the house. I can replicate that situation for practicing as often as I need to in order for it to become basic motor planning for him. He hears the alarm. He goes outside and he knows to go to our neighbor, Christy's house. This brings me to the most important thing that you need to hear for this whole presentation. In all of these situations that we talk about today, please remember to take a look at the overarching theme and then personalize it to the individual. We will give you good information, but it needs to be modified to meet the needs of the individual in order to maximize its effectiveness. When there is a medical emergency, usually an EMS response is the one that's warranted. Sometimes an EMS team from the local fire department will arrive first due to their proximity to your home. In either case, an ambulance should only be called for emergencies that are need to get that patient transported quickly for treatment or to stabilize a person quickly. The EMS on site, just like both of our first responders here with us today, have indicated are gonna ask a bunch of questions about the injury or the medical situation. 
As a person with a disability, it is imperative that one of the first things you do is to share your what your mode of communication is. If it's writing, indicate that so that you can write out what you need. If it is a speech um, generation generating device, point to that, indicate that you need that device in order to communicate. If it's sign language, indicate that. For you to receive prompt treatment, they need to know how to best approach the interview part of the evaluation. We want them to get the best and most accurate information as efficiently as possible so that stabilizing treatment can begin. Be sure to share with them all of the medications that you take daily. Have them written down, have them on your phone. Even if they're over the counter meds, this information is critical, especially when you go to the hospital for the hospital team in order to ensure that there's no contradictory medications or perhaps a situation that might be more pronounced because of a medication. And I'll talk about maybe the use of ibuprofen um, later in this presentation. It is also important to share with the EMS team if you have specialized equipment that you need while you're at the hospital. Just in case you're admitted, you want that equipment to go with you. A few examples of why you would want to call the 911 for an EMS response are a serious injury, broken bones, heavy bleeding, a head injury, just for to name a few, choking, heart attack, possible stroke, incoherence, and an overdose. What you're going to want to know right off the bat is you're going to share your name, your location. You need to be able to describe the injury or medical crisis. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? What happened right before the injury? The number of the people that are injured or involved, especially in the case of a car accident, so that we can make sure that enough responders report to the scene. Any information about the disability that the EMS team should know before they arrive. So while you're on the phone with the dispatcher, for instance, I mentioned earlier, turning off the sirens, approach slowly. Um, anything that you think that they might need to know that you can share with that dispatcher and it can be shared in route in order to make it a more efficient response when they actually get on scene. Marley, would you like to talk to us about a response from a police? Sure thing. Thank you. Uh, when talking to dispatchers, uh, there are several things that you want to uh, go over first. What is it? If you're in a dis domestic dispute situation, you want to find a safe place in the home to lock yourself in and call the police. Give them your name, your address, de describe your partner. And if you're able to stay on the line with the dispatcher until first responders arrive, do so. If there is a person with an intellectual disability in the home or even a physical disability in the home, make sure to inform dispatchers of that, what they look like and how best to approach them. If you can escape the home, do so. Head to the nearest safe space you can think of. When safe, call 911. A break-in or a robbery situation, the same thing could apply. Stay quiet and stay hidden. If able to exit the home safely, do so and call the police. If you have been trained properly to defend yourself, that's wonderful. However, if you are not trained um, for your safety and the safety of other members in the home, stay quiet and escape out of the home if possible. Let them take whatever they take because it is not worth your safety and that of your family members. A noise complaint, um, we all do it. We all sometimes call on our neighbors. Uh, they're partying too much, too loud, it's 3 a.m. Uh, so those, they're pretty common. A miss, in a missing person situation, you're, again, you're gonna call the police. You're gonna tell them the name of the person, their age, the clothing they were wearing, who they were with, and where they were last seen. If this is a person with an intellectual disability, Describe the nature of this, the disability and how best to approach them when found. Police are there to stop the threat first. An example of that would be an active shooter or the robber. They cannot help you, the victim, until the threat is no longer a threat. After that, they will tend to your needs and anyone else in the crowd based on the, the priority. You must keep in mind that you may have to wait your turn. 
It can take time, but stay calm and try not to lash out at first responders. Remember that there are steps each first responder must take before tending to you. For example, if there's a gunshot victim, of course, they're going to tend to the gunshot victim first and then proceed down the list of individuals present. D. Thank you. When we experience a trauma or a stressful life event like those that we are discussing today, research has shown that people have many different types of reactions. They may feel physically and mentally drained. Some have difficulty making decisions or staying focused. They state that they feel as almost as if they're in a fog. Many experience changes to their sleep patterns or in their eating habits. Feeling sad, tired, numb, lonely, or worried are common experiences following a trauma. All of these may lead the person to become easily frustrated and might even lead to arguments with families and friends, which might not have occurred otherwise. After any crisis, it is okay to feel these things. It's actually normal. What's important though, is for you to recognize how you are feeling and being honest with yourself about it so that you can become action oriented. This will take time. Getting ourselves and our lives back doesn't happen overnight. Trauma changes us. We need to give ourselves time to regulate to that new normal. So what action steps can we take as individuals to help us feel more even-footed during a time where our world has shifted? The first and most important thing we can do is to ensure that we're safe. This means finding a place to stay, addressing your physical health needs by getting medical attention if it's needed, and having access to food, water, and medication. Hoping to feel a bit more in control is taking care of things that we can control, like choosing to eat healthy foods, getting rest, and staying connected with family and friends. These help to mentally ground us while we start to make decisions. During this time, remember to be patient with yourself and those around you. You may need more time to figure out what to do. Meanwhile, others are giving you advice and suggestions at a pace much faster than you can deal with. This can add to the feeling that you aren't in control. It's okay to remind them that you know that they want to help you and then thank them for caring so much. But also be just as honest that you need to step back and think things through a bit. That is okay and it's much less stressful than making a rash decision that later you have to deal with. After some time, you might find that you aren't feeling any better. You might still be feeling angry, overwhelmed, or frustrated all of the time, or perhaps you're not eating, or you're eating too much, or you're not sleeping, or you're sleeping too much. You may be feeling hopeless. When this is, when is this normal, and when should you seek additional assistance? Rule of thumb is that if you are feeling this way or experiencing these sy symptoms for longer than two weeks, then it's probably time to reach out and talk to a professional. A therapist, social worker, church leader, or psychologist, just to name a few. These are all trained professionals that can help you work through your experience and emotional emotions in a way that can help you find a better balance towards moving forward. Oftentimes, the police officer that responds or the hospital can give you information on these resources. Don't discard this information as it often will be a bit of time before you realize that you actually need to reach out to someone. So hold on to it. Rigo and Brad, we've been talking about the role of the first responder as the, as versus the, our personal role. Is there anything that either of you would like to add as far as that role position before we move on to how to prepare for specific types of emergencies? Uh, I would, uh, first of all, I want to say the information that you're providing is great. Um, I think that uh, you guys are covering all of the necessary information, which I feel like I've kind of, I kind of stole some of your thunder by answering some of the questions earlier and everything that I mentioned earlier was, was covered here. But uh, the only thing to add is, yes, just be, I mean, and you guys mentioned it, but just to be patient with us, because like you said, we're, as Marley said, we're showing up to, uh, 
uh, address whatever the situation is, uh, if it's an active threat, whatever it may be, or even if it's a crash, we're looking for um, if if we happen to beat the fire department there, which doesn't happen too often, but um, we're looking to try and save lives and protect lives in whatever way possible. And so it while it seems heartless or brutal to say, hey, we're, we're it may seem that we're we don't care because we're walking by people as we're doing other things, someone who potentially needs our help, but we're trying to address what we feel is the most important thing at that time. And then from there, like she stated, um, we come back and address issues as the level of, as we feel the level of importance is. And, and so I think this is excellent information. Thank you. I was going to say, Brad, do you have anything? Yeah, with what Rigo said, that's the big thing is just because we go by somebody, please don't think that you're any less important. We just have to go to the worst, to the least. Um, now, we also don't know. So if there's a time that you're like, man, I know Jackie and Jackie's not acting right. I mean, we need to know that. So you might have to be the advocate. You might have to say, I, I understand you think this, but this is not. Because if we don't know what's normal, we won't know what's abnormal. So communication is a key. Just make sure you advocate because we're not around anybody enough to know what's normal unless we know them on a day-to-day -day basis. So you might have to advocate for yourself or for someone else. Great. Thank you both for sharing some additional um, information there. Now, Marley and I would like to go in to how to prepare for specific types of emergencies. Obviously, we cannot cover every eventuality or every way to prepare, but our goal today is to give you some of the basic information and getting you to think about how to personalize it for your particular situation. Marley, would you be willing to go ahead and move forward towards talking on how to prepare for a fire? Yes, I will do my best. So uh, how to prepare for a fire. First, install fire alarms. Uh, your local Red Cross team could uh, actually assist you with those. Check them monthly. Replace batteries as needed. Have a gas and water shutoff tool. Um, have a gas or shutoff water tool. Have a primary and secondary escape routes in the home. Uh, getting out the front door, the back door, or the windows. If you have a house with two or more floors, have you considered adding ladders and having them readily available up there? Um, where are you meeting your family once outside? Make sure to have a specific location planned across the street or at the neighbor down the road. Um, once out of immediate danger, call 911. Things to, like to consider. Place important paperwork together in a secure but easily accessible location in the home where you can grab them and go. It is recommended that you have more than one copy securely stashed away. Important paperwork could be a birth certificates, social security cards, medical records, medical medication lists, financial documentation, mortgage and insurance paperwork. And another thing to consider is having a fireproof safe or a fireproof document bag. Uh, and it looks kind of like this, where you can secure all your items and protect them should a fire break out. Now, in chemical exposure, you can install a carbon monoxide detector in the home, and I believe the local Red Cross team can assist with that as well. Also have a gas and water shuttle tool, which I well, it looks like this. This is really big, but that's a two-in-one package. Um, and then things to consider in that situation. If you're outside and there has been a chemical exposure, move away as far away from the affected area until you are breathing fresh air. Stay calm. Call, call 911. If you are indoors and there has been a chemical exposure, exit the building quickly and find fresh air. Again, stay calm, call 911. If you are exposed to chemicals through your clothing, 
Um, it is recommended that you take those clothes off as quickly as possible, wash them, um, clothing, take them off and wash off your body as quickly as possible with water. Do not place your clothing with other personal belongings because those could be contaminated. And in certain cases, they can transmit through contact. So be careful with clothes that you take off. Best to probably just throw them in a garbage bag. Uh, if your eyes are exposed to, um, to chemicals or gases, rinse them with water as quickly as possible. If you've been exposed uh, for a prolonged period of time and you're feeling sick, head to the ER as quickly as possible for treatment. Um, some th symptoms can include watery and burning eyes, headaches, vomiting, nausea, and then um, in severe, the nausea in severe uh, instances. If you were exposed to chemicals from containers or cleaning products, those tend to have uh, instructions on what to do if you are exposed. And there is the number for poison control. Now Dee's going to take it over again. Yep, thank you, Marley. When you've experienced an injury, the first thing to do is to assess whether it's one that can be treated at home with basic over-the-counter items or whether you need to be seen by a professional. If you are unsure, then getting in to have a professional evaluate the injury is probably best. It is important to consider what medications you have been taking have been taken by the individuals as they also might impact the injury. And this goes back to what I was stating earlier with an EMS response. Um, some medications can cause an injury to be much worse than what would naturally be assumed. For instance, someone who takes a lot of ibuprofen, they may bleed more. And so an injury which involves bleeding may actually be more serious than if they did not take that medication. Another consideration is the impact of the disability on the response. Someone with autism could have such a severe fear with the sight of blood, and some neurotypicals have a severe fear of blood as well. And it's so intense that it causes their heart rate to increase dramatically. In a bleeding situation, that's gonna cause more pumping of blood. So we have to consider these things. As we've stated before, it's really important to know the full circumstances as much as you're able to, so that you can react appropriately. Knowing this information is really helpful when in an emergency and having to relay it to a dispatcher quickly. So what types of injuries should you be prepared for at home? Some examples include minor cuts, minor bruises, minor burns, and splinters. Think about, you know, just the little things we're always hoping our kids at home with, right? Those are things we should be prepared for within our home. So to do those, you need a first aid kit. Within your first aid kit, thank you, Marley's showing us one, you should have items like antiseptic wipes, Band-Aids of various sizes, Neosporin, thermometer, gauze, gauze tape, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Benadryl, and tweezers. And most over-the-counter, you can buy the small ones to put in your car. You can buy the bigger ones. Most of them have these basic supplies, and you can buy them pre-made. Or if you have these supplies at home, gather them, kind of keep them in, a, in one area. You want to have access to all of them at one time in case you need that. Each house should have at least one. I actually have one on each floor because I never know where my son is going to get clumsy and get a boo-boo. And then you also should have a basic first aid kit in your car, whether you keep it in the glove box where I keep it or you keep it in the trunk, you know, or just any other compartment. A med kit, on the other hand, is one that's used to treat more serious injuries and has items to use in a trauma situation. Items in a med kit might include things like PPE. We all, a year ago, none of us knew what that was. Now we, we know that's having gloves, mask, eye protection, things like that. We also need patient assessment tools in a med kit. That could be items that are used to assess and measure vital function. function. So a stethoscope, a blood pressure cuff, a micro pulse oximeter, a thermometer, and a CO2 monitor. There should be trauma supplies. So these are tools designed to stop bleeding or to seal off a penetrating trauma. Some examples of that are hemostatic dressings of different sizes and purposes, 
a large assortment of regular dressing in multiple sizes, a combination of bandage wraps, especially have the four inch and the six inch size, heavy duty one inch and two inch tape, open chest injury seals, multiple sizes of that are preferred, and tourniquets. We also might have airway breathing management equipment in there. And it can range all the way from a simple airway kit to a full airway management pack. And that equipment might have basic airway stabilization protection, such as an oral or nasal airway, a pocket mask, or a manual suction device. It might have a collapsible bag valve mask or chest compression supplies, or it may actually have more invasive airway controls, such as intubation um, materials. As you can see, a med kit is prepared to deal with quite serious injuries, similar to what an EMS would carry. At home, you don't necessarily need this unless your child has a medical condition that, or the person with a disability has a medical condition that indicates that you need this level of trauma care um, equipment. You should maintain a first aid kit with items that you can personally use and don't require significant medical training to use. And it's important, this is really important, that you replenish your first aid kit as fast as you use the items to ensure that you have what you need when you need it. There's absolutely nothing worse than open that first aid kit looking for a Band-Aid and it's not there, it's been used. So now I'd like to talk about a little bit about assaults. The thought of an assault is terrifying to all of us. There are a few things that we can do to protect ourselves though. I want you to consider the following options and how they relate to your environment. At home, make sure your windows and doors are kept locked. If Have a peephole if it's possible. If possible, use a dead bolt for your exterior doors. Having an alarm system is also beneficial. A little known trick that I've been told about and that I actually do is when you buy a car, you're often given two sets of key fobs, okay? I keep one in the very top drawer in a little box so it's easy for me to reach in and feel it in my nightstand next to my bed. And this trick is if I would hear something that doesn't sound right, we all know noises of our house. We all know and can identify, oh, that's the cat jumping down and I'm going to, you know, hang him by his tail tomorrow for waking me up at 3 a.m. versus that that was glass breaking. That's not a normal sound. Or I hear footsteps on the steps and I can hear my son sleeping in the other room. When you're in that situation, you could press the panic button on your keychain. And what that does is it's going to set your car alarm off. That is so loud that it is bound to wake up neighbors. And that's exactly what you want to do because it can be a natural deterrent, just like an alarm system in your house, to that person who's just come into your home. Hopefully it's going to scare off that intruder. Within the community, you can carry a can of mace as a protection device. One of the things I do, I don't carry mace, but I carry a tiny little 99 cents bottle of hairspray from Target, Walmart, wherever you shop, right? Even, you know, Giant Eagle. And sometimes I have a bad hair day. I use it for as a natural resource to make this, this uh, little bouffant thing work better. But other times I know that it's in my purse or in my carry bag. And if somebody would go to attach, attack me, or get to me, I can spray this towards their eyes. Hairspray is naturally sticky. Not only is it gonna burn, but it's gonna stick to their eyelashes. It's gonna stick to their face and it's going to buy you a moment to escape. So this is something simple that you can keep and all of us, almost all of us can use it on a daily basis anyhow. You can also carry your keys in your hand. So like I said, most of us have key fobs now. So I see a lot of people just carrying the fob, right? Because they keep their inner door in the garage unlocked. Go ahead and put your house key on there. This is more than about access to your house. This is about safety. You can put this key between when you're leaving work or leaving somewhere. You can have your keys ready in your hand 
put the key between your fingers like this as you're walking and the fob in your fist so that it's firm. This is a basic weapon that you can have with you at all times. If somebody comes and approaches you, I don't want you to use this and try to go for their arm. You're not going to do any damage. You go for the eye because even if you miss the eye, the whole area around that eye is super sensitive and that's going to prompt them to hopefully back away. So again, these are things that you have with you at all times. Think about them as weapons. What, we, what we're trying to help you understand is we want you to think about what weapons you have before you actually need a weapon. Some other examples are a flashlight, an umbrella. So I keep my umbrella when you open the car door and then you have the car seat. There's that little piece between the car seat and the car door. And I don't keep it on the door handle. I actually keep it in just the little area where the seatbelt would connect. I leave this there. I don't leave it in the back. I don't leave it in the back seat. And that way, when I open my door, if somebody tries to attack me, that's right there for me to grab. I can pick it up. I can hit them with it this way, or I can pop it up, right? Which gives me a longer range of motion and just beat the crap out of them, right? That's my goal. Beat the crap until they back away. You can also use your purse, a bag that you're carrying, anything to hit the person. These are all really important techniques to just think about that any of us can use. And it's with any item. Pay attention to your surroundings. Officer um, Quintanilla shared with me that he calls it hardening the target. And what he means by that is making yourself someone harder to attack. So when a person who is looking for an easy target looks at you, they're like, ah, I better move on to an easier target. That person is paying attention. A few ways to do this, keep your head up. Do not be looking down on your phone. Do not be texting. There is no way you're truly paying attention to your environment if you're doing that. Have your keys out and ready before you leave a building and avoid walking alone in the dark. If you're at work, Consider having someone escort you to your car if it's dark or leave with a group of colleagues at night. You can even have a planned leaving time that you guys all leave together. We are instinctive creatures. That's who we are. Our survival mode puts us into fight or flight. So if something feels off, trust your instinct and get to safety. Don't wait for there to be an apparent sign. Trust your instinct. If you're really concerned about being assaulted, you could also contact your local police department and they can give you recommendations on where to take self-defense classes. In the chat box, I'd like for you to quickly share some other everyday items you think that could be used to defend yourself when you're out in the community. Each of you probably have other things that you have in your car, in your purse, that could be used for self-defense and you might give an idea to somebody else. So share some items that you could potentially use. May I chime in really very quickly? Absolutely. Um, I have a very large flashlight in my hand right now. I don't know if you guys can see this camera, but I have one just this big in my car because I am a manual wheelchair user. So I'm not likely to be able to reach someone because they're not at my eye level. So I can use this, though, to inflict a little bit of uh, some pain and hopefully some for me to be able to escape. Uh, and then for a lot of us who have a physical disability, we might be thinking, oh, I'm not gonna be able to defend myself properly. There's there's no way I can defend myself. I'm, I'm, I'm in a wheelchair, I'm physically disabled, there's no way. Well, one, you have to rethink that narrative. Um, Think about the things that you can do versus the things that you cannot do, and then go from there. Um, like Dee mentioned, you could be you could be seen as an easy target. I know I sometimes feel like an easy target getting in and out of my car or going out on my own. Um, but I've also been told that because I look like this, I could also even potentially surprise uh, an attacker with what I'm capable or not capable of doing. So honestly, really think deep about what you are able to do and then build on that. 
some of the some of the other things that people mention is to have a whistle. That's a great idea. Or a pen. Pens are sharp as well. Someone mentioned your voice. Absolutely. Make yourself heard. Scream. Okay. Um, someone mentioned that having a flashlight is also a great um, temporary block to or limit their vision. If you turn it on and shine it in their eyes, you know, so you can blind first and hit second. Um, someone says they do carry mace and they um, telling help to scream. One of the things that they tell you to scream is not to scream help, but to scream fire. I was about and the to reason being that. is we have become desensitized as a society to the word help. But if you scream fire, everybody's going to look to see where the fire is. It's just our natural voyeuristic nature. So take advantage of that. I love this. Somebody put a collapsible hot dog roasting stick. It's a campfire tool. I love that. And okay. If your home can be used as a tool, really. It's just a matter of, again, changing that narrative. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Those are great ideas. So Marley, let's take it to the break-in and robbery situation. Okay. So again, if you're hearing footsteps, breaking glass, opening and closing doors, shuffling and of furniture being moved around in your house, you know no one's home. Um, so nothing should be moving around. I'd like D mentioned, stay calm. If you can escape, do so quickly. Where again, think about your escape routes in the home because we already planned those out. Um, hide if you're not able to escape as best as you can and try to keep the noise low. When you call 911, excuse me, provide them with your name, address, location, and if others are with you, a person with an intellectual disability is in the home, explain that to 911, 911, and make sure you tell them how to, uh, how to approach that person. If the intruders are visible, try to keep identifying markers in the back of your mind. Report details to the first responder. Is the intruder tall, short? Um, what are their eye color, hair color? Are they male or female? I have tattoos on my hands. So if I commit a robbery and someone sees my hand and not wearing a glove, they can say, she's got a tattoo that reads, just be you on her hand. That is distinctive. I have all these moles and freckles all over my face. Those are also very distinctive things about me. I'm a wheelchair user. That is pretty distinctive. So the police are looking for someone with a tattoo on their hand, a wheelchair user, and then freckled that they got me right-handed. They caught me. So um, what are you wearing? What do you have? Um, do they have visible tattoos or features that uh, can ID them? Again, if you have a weapon on hand, you could be it could be held, but Keep in mind that most weapons require training. Without practice or training, a weapon could be more dangerous. Um, again, this is very repetitive information because it, it does kind of work in the same thing as other situations too. Um, do you have a garage door is, and is it properly closed? Are there security cameras? You can easily purchase security cameras on Amazon now and monitor, monitor them via your smartphone or Alexa or Google Home. Again, the spare key, consider having that next to your bed. If there, you hear noises, that alarm will go off and hopefully will deter uh, the intruders. Nothing is fail proof. However, you are more likely to survive if you plan, prepare and practice different scenarios. At best, you could learn to process the situation quickly not panic and respond more effectively instead of reacting. And now Dee is going to talk about drug overdose. Thanks, Marley. Watching the news, we are almost inundated with stories of drug overdoses. It's heartbreaking and just terrifying. We need to be more prepared than we often are for this situation. Consider having the number for poison control listed right in your phone contacts. It's actually on the slide for you. If you wanna program your phone right now, I'm good with that. As of one of only 55 American Association of Poison Control Regional, Regional Certified Centers, the Central Ohio Poison Control, it provides state-of-the-art poison prevention, assessment, and treatment for 64 out of the 88 counties. 
it handles, just to give you an idea of how um, much of a problem this is, it handles more than 42,000 poison expo exposure calls annually. Okay, that is just the Central Ohio Poison Control Center. It is confidential and it offers free emergency po poison treatment advice and it's available to the public 24 seven. You may also be interested in participate, participating in the Be Poison Smart program. It's gonna teach you poison prevention education um, and it's through um, the Ohio Department of Education Health, Head Start, and the Ohio Hospital Association. So there's some big names that are involved in this to try to help families be more proactive. So if you think someone may, someone may be poisoned, you certainly can call the poison control number at 1-800-222-1222. But how can we be preventative? This is, the, this is our purpose today. How do we plan ahead of time? How can we be proactive? And one of the most important things you can do is properly dispose of any medications that you are no longer required to use. Many cities have drug take back days and locations where unneeded prescription medication can be dropped off or be turned in to be disposed of safely. Do not throw it away in a trash can where it can be accessed by someone else or by an animal or flush it down the toilet. If someone you know has overdosed on a medication and they are still alert and they're able to share what has happened, then the poison, poison control center can usually tell you what you need to do in order to ensure the person stays stabilized. If they are unconscious or no longer breathing, call 911 immediately and the dispatcher can talk you through how to help the individual until the EMS arrives. If you hear a lot about Narcon today on the news, and if you're interested in learning about it, a, it's a prescription medicine used for the treatment of known or suspected op opioid overdose emergencies with signs of breathing problems and severe sleepiness or not being able to respond at all. You can contact your local fire department about upcoming trainings and how to get Narcon to keep on hand in case of an emergency. But Project Dawn is also providing free Narcan kits, and I've written that on the slide, to individuals and groups across the state of Ohio. And if you're interested in ordering a kit, you can simply Google Project Dawn Ohio Department of Health, and you can look up the um, sites by each county where you can get a free kit, and it has the Narcon in it, why you use it, when you use it, and how to use it. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to get the Narcon out in our community in case it's ever needed. A common event for many people are when we miss a dose of medication. Usually we can take it when we remember and everything's gonna be just fine. Sometimes though, missed medication can cause a medical crisis. In this case, we need to call 911 immediately for medical help. For instance, someone who is diabetic and doesn't take their insulin as directed by their medical professional can experience quite concerning symptoms such as disorientation, severe fatigue, they can become unconscious and even go into a diabetic coma. These are serious issues and they can lead to death. It is imperative to prepare for medication intake by first making sure that you have the medication on hand that you require. Keep your prescriptions filled in a timely manner. Most pharmacies offer automatic refills and they'll contact you to let you know your prescription medication is ready to be picked up. My sons are on an automatic thing and they'll text me and say, are you ready to refill? I type one, which means yes. Then they text me back and say, we will refill it. And then when it's done, they text me and let me know that it's ready to be picked up. So I don't have to think about, oh, in five days, I'm going to run out. So that's a really great way to kind of set that up as a reminder for you. Another thing to consider is, you know, how are you going to remember what times to take it? Okay. You can use a pill box an electronic pill dispenser, an app, or a calendar reminder. Pharmacists can even dispense the medication in pill sleeves or bubbles. So you know how when you buy a pack of Tylenol, two Tylenol tablets are in one little pill bubble, right? What they can do is take all your morning meds and put them in one pill bubble. So, and it will say breakfast on the back of it. And it'll say what's in there. And then you just open that little pill sleeve 
and the pills that you need for breakfast are in there. This is extremely beneficial for people with disabilities who might confuse when to take a particular medication or struggle maybe to open the bottles um, and being able to have it in that little pill sleeve is easier for them. They can use scissors to cut it open. When thinking about an overdose or a missed medication, pre-planning your action is imperative to ensure an appropriate and a timely response. So Marley's gonna to talk to us about when you have personal equipment that you need to be aware of. Thank you, Dee. So for many of us, using durable medical equipment is what keeps us moving. I can't walk, but I can roll and move around with relative ease. However, I also need to think about what to do should my wheelchair break down. Um, here are some things to consider as you think about your equipment. Create a list of all your durable medical equipment. Have basic uh, tools and backups for spare parts. For example, I have backup. I have a backup cushion for my wheelchair. I also have backup nuts and bolts in case I break down. I also have a backup wheelchair if my spare um, my backup wheelchair. Sorry, should I break down completely? Uh, I also have considered folding a yoga mat and sitting on it should my spare cushion also break down. So there's different things that we can uh, think about and process. It is also recommended that you have photos of your equipment as well as their model type and serial numbers. I would also recommend you speak to your durable medical equipment providers about their internal process for replacing damaged or stolen equipment. An example is if your DME is stolen, uh, your provider might need to see a copy of the police report as proof to be able to replace your equipment. The same could apply for controlled medications, such as pain pills. You have to speak to your providers and ask them what documentation they need, if any. Um, if uh, medical equipment. Okay, sorry, I'm reading through my stuff. You can also request, uh, you can talk to your durable medical equipment and medical supply companies on replacing trucks uh, that you need, gloves, uh, catheters, any of that. So again, you can talk to their, uh, your providers and find out exactly what their process will require of you um, if something should happen. Those of, of you who use power wheelchairs may want to consider having a manual wheelchair as a backup should the battery um, need to be preserved or the battery just dies on you. This is more realistic for sheltering in place examples, such as snowstorms or what happened with COVID-19. But consider what you would need in order to be able to survive short term and potentially long term, given a situation where your power wheelchair cannot be used or accessed. And so, these guys so are service animals. Yep, so another thing we need to consider when we're thinking about personal equipment, right, is our service animals. Um, they're important to consider in, a, in an event of an emergency. Dogs who are acknowledged by the American Disabilities Act as service an, animals perform the following task. They act as a guide dog for the visually impaired. They act as a hearing or signal dog for a person with a significant hearing loss or is deaf and they're a seizure response dog, or perhaps a psychiatric service dog, but they're all specifically trained to understand the needs of their person that they're supporting, and also to lessen some of the effects of how that disability impacts their lives. As I said, these animals are trained according to a rigorous curriculum and are trained to provide support directly related to the person's disability. They are as important as a prosthetic leg to an amputee. Therefore, these animals can usually accompany an individual to a shelter or a hospital. However, you do need to know that if a service animal is out of control, it's barking, jumping, interfering with the service being provided, or if it's a direct threat to the health and safety of others, then that service animal may be removed even under ADA, AD, American Disability Act guidelines. Thinking of the stress of an emergency, people will often assume that an emotional support animal can accompany them. 
However, even though the event itself might be very stressful for someone, emotional support animals are not covered by the American Disabilities Act. Depending on your location, they might be covered by your local laws though. So one of the things thinking about planning is you need to research your laws and know what those are and whether or not an emotional support animal is able to accompany you following an emergency to a place to a, like a shelter or a hospital. So when you have a service animal, what can you do to make sure things go as smoothly as possible in a time of crisis? You've got to have a plan. First, be prepared to explain to the first responders that you have a service animal and that you have a legal right to be evacuated with your service animal. Explain how the dog helps you and what it specifically does to allow you to be independent. Shelters and hospitals are not prepared to shelter your dog. So make sure you have a to-go kit specifically made up for them. Some items to include in that bag are food, water, dishes, ID tags, an extra harness or, harness or leash, vet contact information, their shot records, any medications they take, a blanket, a favorite toy, and any other items that you know help make your service animal feel comfortable. Another really important item to consider and to plan for is to be prepared to function without the assistance of your service animal. As Marley indicated earlier with the powered wheelchair, if her battery dies, she's gotta have a backup plan. If your service animal is injured in the emergency, they may not be able to perform their duties. And so it's best when you're practicing for emergency preparedness that you do drills with your service animal, but also without your service animal using alternative methods just to be prepared for both scenarios. Marley? So uh, on the slide that we're on right now, it, it gives you examples of what an emergency info card may look like. Uh, examples could include, but they're not limited to your name, an ID, uh, a picture of you, your communication style, address, phone number, email, disability, primary durable medical equipment. Again, don't forget the model type and serial numbers, allergies, and medications. Do you have an emergency contact person? And make sure you include their name and their phone number. And try to have more than one emergency contact. It is also recommended that you have at least one emergency contact out of state should your state be in the middle of, uh, of an evacuation and a mass emergency. So having someone out of state that you can reach out to and connect with as you're evacuating would be incredibly helpful for you. Some other details could include your secondary mode of communication, going from a speech device to a paper and pen or a whiteboard and markers, uh, your secondary durable medical equipment, going from your power wheelchair to a manual wheelchair, doctors and their contact information, the dependents, your children or adult parents if applicable to you. And include pictures of them as well if you're able. And then D is going to talk, take it over from here. Thanks, Marley. Before we go into the Q&A, Brad, Enrico, is there anything you'd like to add um, quickly related to how to best prepare for emergencies? Brad, we'll start with you. A few things real quick I wanna talk about and then we can maybe hit later. Um, when you're talking about fire escape plans, uh, one thing we're hitting hard on is sleeping with your door closed. Um, there is a website and uh, it's like close your door, close your door.org. There's a video showing the difference of a room where in the same hallway where a fire goes through, where the doors open and close and it's a matter of life or death. So we know we're not going to be able to get out quickly in a fire if we have everything ready let alone if we have a issue where we have a wheelchair, we got to get out. It's very important to keep that door closed at night because that could be what saves your life. Um, the other thing is when you get out, stay out. We're, let the professionals do our job. Let us know. Cops, our cops are amazing. They get on scene. They're telling us, pulling up, hey, you have one person inside. We know what we're doing. 
we've seen too many times around the nation where people go back in and they go back in for the loved one or a pet or something and they don't make it back out. So, and then here's my key thing. And my, my wife even hits me on this. When I go to a hotel, I go to a restaurant, I go any place, look at all your exits, make sure you have two ways out, whether it's a fire or an active shooter or something, everybody is trained to go out the way we came in and that kills people sometimes. So make sure you know both ways out. That's all I have. Thanks, Brad. Rigo, anything to add? Uh, I really don't have anything to add. I think your guys' presentation covered a lot of the basic information. Obviously, anything that we would need further would be more extensive or more of an investigation. But I uh, will piggyback on what Brad said and what his wife said. Every time I go anywhere, I'm always looking to see uh, how am I going to get out, or where a potential threat is coming from, um, and then your alarm from the bed, that's a great idea. I've never had heard that one before, but that's a great idea. Um, and uh, as you mentioned that I, we, that you talked about was the, uh, don't make yourself a victim. Uh, make yourself as confident, walk like you know where you're going, like you know what you're doing. Don't be afraid to make eye contact with people and let them know that you see them. Not only do they see you, you see them. Um, and that confidence in and of itself is, very good for protecting you. Thanks. And I, I will say that I travel overseas all the time and people are always, and it's just my son and I, and they're like, oh, you'll go walk the streets. And I'm like, yeah. And it is about how you carry yourself. That makes a difference. Um, well, we could certainly stay here all day sharing information with you about emergency preparedness. There is literally that much information. However, we recognize that our short time together today there was no way to cover everything. We tried to give you information to start planning for emergencies and what to consider in those plans. And we'd like to open the session now for the Q&A. And if you post a question in the Q&A box, we'll answer them live. We'd also like to ask you to stay around. We have something special for a special raffle that we're gonna do following the Q&A. Deb is gonna draw five names and those five individuals will be So we're going to switch and go live right now. And as I was saying, Deb is going to drive, draw five names from our attendees. And um, those five people will be um, winning tonight a duffel bag that has up to $400 of emergency preparedness uh, tools and um items that you might need in an emergency. So obviously that's a, that's a big item. It's, you know, these bags are worth about $400 each. So stick around and we'll have you um, have that raffle in a few minutes. But in the meantime, if you have questions that we can all answer, please post them in the Q and A and I'll moderate that. Um, so Mary says, I missed the beginning of the class. Is it recorded for YouTube or Facebook? Absolutely it is, Mary. Um, nice to see you. I actually know Mary. So um, any other questions, please post them in the chat or the Q&A and we will answer those right now. And in the meantime, one of the things I, I while we're waiting for a question, I really want to make sure that people understand is this was meant to be um, an overarching kind of a theme tonight, whereas we try to identify as many potential crises as possible in emergency situations and give you a brief overview of things to think about and consider as far as um, to prepare. But please remember, as I stated at the beginning of this, you must individualize it to the person, whether it's yourself and you're a person with a disability or you're a caregiver or you're a professional working with people with disabilities, you've got to personalize this to make sure it meets the needs of the actual individual for it to be, power, to be uh, effective. Is the PowerPoint able to be shared? Um, we could, but as you see, you're not going to get a whole lot of information. We did a lot more talking than what the PowerPoints talked about. So Ashley, um, the main thing to do is probably 
have access to that YouTube video so that you could go back and take notes and like you could pause the video and take notes as you're going through it. Um, but thank you for asking. We also have uh, 14 other webinars posted on our YouTube page. Uh, we recently hosted about 14 of them. Uh, each one has a different topic, subject matter, pertaining to individuals with disabilities preparing for emergencies. So you might be able to find some useful information in those webinars as well, because it elaborates a lot more on what we did here today. And, and so I'm gonna ask you guys, you attendees this evening, what is one thing tonight that you learned that's an easy strategy that you can do that you hadn't thought of before? Share with us in the chat box, what's one strategy that you learned about tonight that would be easy to bring into your life? And in the meantime, I'm going to answer a question that came into the uh, chat box. And I'm going to ask uh, probably Rigo and um, Brad to back me up on this one. It says, what if there are no safe neighbors to send my autism spectrum disorder daughter to in an emergency? We're dealing also with stranger danger, complex domestic safety situations, and issues within our living environment. That's tricky. Um, I, I will flat out say that I'm very fortunate. I have absolutely wonderful neighbors um, that have lived next to me for years and years and years. They know my son. They actually have a key to my house. Um, so that way, if CJ would run over there, he's been taught to lock the door. Every time he leaves the door, he's been taught that. And that way, if he runs over there and he says, house fire, call 911, which is what he's been taught to say, they have a key. If they know I'm still in the house, they have a key to give the first responders as well. So I, I'm fortunate with that. But I think also one of the things you need to consider is how can you identify to your daughter by whether it's a bracelet. So I use like a road ID bracelet for my son that has identifying information on this. And this came up this morning when we were in session and it identifies his name and the year he was born. So they can get a rough ballpark of how old he is. It says, you know, autism, communication issues. And then it says music is calming. So that way a first responder knows what to do to calm him down, has my phone number, but it also has a backup phone number on it. And you can order it from road ID and they're really inexpensive. They look just like all these other bracelets that everybody else is wearing, which is wonderful. It doesn't make your kid a target. Um, but part of it is if you're not even sure your daughter's going to go to the neighbor, because that was always my fear. It was like, would my son actually go to the neighbors versus go outside and look at the snow and be all excited like he has been the last two days? Um, then having something like this on your daughter certainly would benefit in case she does go off somewhere else and somebody finds her. Um, but I would actually find a neighbor that you can build a relationship with that could be that support. Um, and it's just going to, you're going to, my feeling is as a mom, I'm willing to step outside of my comfort zone and have my daughter go to my neighbor that I don't know very well versus having my daughter stay in a house that's on fire. So it's kind of like, which one's the priority? So um, Rigo, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, the only thing I wanted to add, I mean, like you said, it's a very tough question um, only because uh, there's a lot of different um, thought process that could go through that. But I, I think you answered it perfect in saying, uh, I mean, worst case scenario is you, you find a place to move to that you can find that. And I know sometimes that's not the easiest option. So I think, like you said, you go out of your comfort zone and and you develop a relationship, even if it's just with one neighbor, or maybe there's a, a, a convenience store nearby or a, a library close by or something um, that can be turned into a safe space um, for the individual by um, teaching them and going through those steps of, hey, if, if, you, if I tell you to run an emergency, they know to go to the corner convenience store. And, they, and the, obviously if, if a, if a, if, a, if a person shows up in distress to the gas station, the first thing that the attendant's going to do is call 911. Um, and, and then we'll try to figure it out from there. But at, like you said, at the very least, they're away from whatever the emergency was 
that they were running from. Um, and if it happens to be the house on fire, then we'll address it, but we, can, we, got, we can't address something we don't know about. And so I think, like you said, it's just, we gotta do the best we can with the information you have and, and try to foster relationships even. And if you don't know somebody that maybe you don't trust them because you don't know them, then maybe it's incumbent on you to get to know them so that you can build a relationship that you can trust them. Brad, any thoughts? I think the big thing, like Rigo said, is fostering those relationships. Um, they're hard. I understand. Um, I'm blessed with great neighbors also, but I understand being in places where you don't trust your neighbors. You, you got to find that safe space. Um, and that safe space might not be something you think is a safe space, but if your kid feels it's a safe space, you know, that convenience store, that library, whatever, that might be the route. Um, and you got to find somebody you trust. It's hard. I and mean, we don't want to trust our people around our kids nowadays. It's not like when I grew up where everybody was, you know, you trusted everybody. It's not there. So it, it's a hard question, but we've got to find that happy median to benefit your kid or your young adult, because we want them to live and we want them to know exactly what to do. And, and I'll piggyback because that parent also responded that the child won't wear a bracelet and things like that. So look at other things that they don't know that they're wearing. So for instance, there are actually tags now that you can write information on and you can iron them on in the back of the shirt so that they don't have that itchy tag feeling and it has identifying information on it. Um, if they're constantly carrying a backpack, having that identifying information inside the backpack, not on the outside of the backpack um, would be beneficial. And then the other thing too, because I happen to know this parent, I know that this kid has a particular stuffed animal that is her favorite stuffed animal and goes everywhere with her. So maybe approaching it as in an emergency, you need to take the stuffed animal, call it by name, over to the neighbors. Don't make it about the kid. Have the kid protecting the neighbors or the stuffed animal, and you may get more cooperation that way. Um, so I'm just giving that person a little bit of a personal perspective because I happen to know this particular family. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. So are you guys ready to go on to the raffle? Marley, did you have something? Well, I was kind of curious. Um, I guess who is the closest person near you guys where you live and like how far away are they from your home? I guess is where I'm, what I'm thinking. Um, she is in apartments, so okay. not very far. Um, and like I said, I just happen to know the family so I can answer to that. Um, but apartment living is complicated because you don't usually know your neighbors and they move in and out and everything else. And, and that's where I guess, like I said, I would have to just kind of trust my gut that would I want my kid to stay in something that I know is a dangerous situation or take a chance and allow, and yes, Dublin area, Brad, um, or take a chance that the child gets to know, it goes to a neighbor's house that might be dangerous versus something that is definitely dangerous. Um, the other thing too is really important as we've mentioned is, you know, get on that data registry list of, you know, contact your local law enforcement and put information about your child in there um, and about how to approach her and her communication issues and things like that. So that way, when they would respond, they recognize the situation. So if they come to your house and the neighbor's like, oh, this little kid came running out of this house, they immediately know what about this particular child they need to do in order to support that child the best way that they can. Hey, D, can I say one more thing? Sure. Also to this person, feel free to reach out to the fire department and the police. Um, we want to be there for you, especially you are a resident of us. So feel free. Do not think that we don't want to help. We will find resources. We will make relationships at least to where they're not afraid of us or they are okay with us coming in because that's another battle. We're coming in with lights and sirens and all kinds of things. And we wanted to know that, hey, we're, we're, we're here for you. It's a great point. And, and that's one of the things that we're very blessed with is, you know, first responders 
they do want to help and they do want to, you know, be proactive versus reactive. They'd rather come in and help identify how they can best support you learning and your child learning how to escape and to get through an emergency versus having to respond to an emergency where you weren't prepared. So um, definitely reach out to your local fire department, police department and get some guidance from them. Um, I have a question for this person, sorry again, um, but would the leasing office be an option for your child when the leasing office is open? Should there an emergency occur would the child be able to get to the leasing office? Another thing I was thinking about, are they able to get into the car and wait until fire department or, po or police officers arrive? Like there's just um, hiding in the stairwell until someone arrives too is a good way. I've, I've done that, I'm not gonna lie. I've done that when I was a kid. And, and I think this is definitely one of those situations where um, having her local first responder come over there and look at the unique situation that she has and giving yes. her ideas based on a unique situation might be the best option rather than us um, guessing. But those are all great ideas for other people who are in the attendance too, to be thinking about as well, you know, what they can do. Um, and then I've just been informed that Jamie is gonna do the raffle. <laughs> so Jamie, are you ready to raffle some items? Yep, let me go ahead and share my screen. Tim Green, our first winner. You guys stand a pretty good chance tonight with the attendance. So we had like 50 this morning. <laughs> so Corby Robinson. Mary. Okay. Uh, forgive me. One, My one more. Okay. <laughs> I'm counting and I'm writing them down. Same. <laughs> Woohoo! He swore it. Awesome. Awesome. Congratulations to you winners. Uh, we have your address from your registration. So those items will be mailed out to you. For the rest of you on here, don't worry. Everybody is gonna get a binder following the presentation. Um, Marley and I are gonna to get together and consolidate all of the information that we have. We have some visual checklists for you as far as what to pack for various emergencies. We also have um, disability specific responses, you know, to consider if you're visually impaired, what this is what you should consider. We have resources from the Red Cross. We have um, different types of um, information cards that you could potentially use and community resources. So we're going to consolidate all this stuff into binders and anyone who came to the training this morning or this evening is going to get a copy of that binder in the mail within the next few weeks. Um, so I definitely want to thank you. And I also want to bring up a comment that came up in the Q&A that Mary shared with us that she practiced over and over with her son and she was actually you know, surprised by what he did understand. And so, but until they practiced, she didn't know what he understood. And, and that's the same thing. So like with my son, I knew unless I burned him with fire, he wasn't going to make that connection and I wasn't willing to do that. And so I was like, what's the next best step is just teach him. He hears that fire smoke alarm go off. He knows he's got to leave the house. And now it's rote. 
you know? And um, so when it goes off, he's like, he has to leave the house. That's exactly what he says. So, um, and that's exactly what we want him to do. We want him to respond appropriately and quickly. And it needs to be motor planning versus so a process that he has to think through. And that's where that practicing and practicing and practicing comes into play. I do wanna thank everybody here tonight. Um, Jamie for being our tech up there, making sure everything ran smoothly. Um, you know, Deb for hosting us, Marley and I, we did the presentation and then a huge thank you to um, Officer uh, Quintin Quintanilla, I can say it right. I'm so excited I can say it right. And then also to um, Brad Flora from the fire department in Washington Township for their invaluable um, contributions to this. Thank you for joining us this evening. We hope that you've learned at least something to move forward on the plan because tonight isn't the end. Tonight's supposed to be the beginning. If you already had a plan or you already had a kit or you had a to-go bag, this is meant to be a stop and think moment to look at what you already have how can you expand upon it so that way you have a more effective safety plan for any future emergencies? And thank you all for attending and hopefully we'll see you sometime soon. Check it out on YouTube. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Be safe, everybody.